All right. I want to welcome everybody to day three. We're in the home stretch now. And uh, for two days, you've been hearing a whole lot about PhosphoFlow and Cytoff as sort of the premier technologies that were featured in this course. And today, you're going to hear more about PhosphoFlow and Cytoff. But actually, you're going to hear a lot more about other technologies. So today is the day where we bring in a variety of, of other technologies really centered around the things that we do in the Human Immune Monitoring Center. Uh, and we're going to feature prominently uh, some of our uh, scientists that work in the center. And um, in the afternoon, we will do some small group demos, which will not be exactly like a wet lab, but it will get you uh, sort of uh, in, in a small group discussion uh, talking about the details of how some of these technologies work. And uh, also today in the morning, you're going to have a few lectures centered around data analysis techniques. So, um, and, and one of the demos as well is going to feature SPADE. So you're going to get uh, a little bit from the bioinformatics side as well. All right, so I'm going to give you the first talk, which is something completely different. I brought this up yesterday. Uh, but it's basically a platform that we've been using for doing qPCR. And uh, specifically, we use it for single cell qPCR. Uh, it's called the uh, Fluidime Biomark. It's made uh, by a company that Steve Quake founded. And uh, it's actually a very nice way to do um, qPCR arrays uh, with very small input amounts of RNA, including even single cells. So, I uh, apologize for those of you who know all of this, but I'll start with a little introduction to what qPCR is. So the Q stands for quantitative, and uh, therefore it differs from a typical polymerase chain reaction or an old-fashioned type of PCR in that you actually can measure the quantitative amount of a signal and not just whether something has accumulated or not accumulated as a result of amplification. And the way that it's quantitated is typically by fluorescence. And so you have a target sequence uh, that the more you amplify it, the more fluorescence is released. There's, very, uh, there's several different ways to do that. The one that actually we use, uh, which is most compatible uh, with the fluidime system, it's kind of what has been worked out on fluidime, uh, is also one of the most common ways to do it uh, in, in general non-nanofluidic systems. And that's called TACMAN. Uh, so the TACMAN system uses primer probe sets where you have a forward primer and a reverse primer. And somewhere in the middle of the gene, you have a probe. And these probes uh, are labeled with two different molecules, one called a reporter and one a quencher, so R and Q, the reporter being the fluorescent molecule, but it's not fluorescent in the close proximity of the quencher. And so what has to happen is you have to get the amplification of this sequence from the forward primer, it displaces this probe and uh, basically chews it up. So now the link between the quencher and the reporter is broken and you get fluorescence signal. So every time that happens, uh, you get another release of fluorescence and you basically can plot the amplification of your gene. The sooner that signal comes up, uh, the more that target sequence was present. This is how you plot the data, and I apologize, these lines are really thin and hard to read uh, from the back of the room, I'm sure. But basically, there's uh, two sets of blue lines, two sets of red lines, and I don't even know what color these other ones are. But um, they are three different reactions uh, that represent different starting amounts of RNA. And you can first of all see, or you could if you were close enough, see that these replicates are very, very tight and uh, they have a characteristic amplification curve. So what we do in quantitating these things is to basically set a threshold. Above this threshold, um, we, we basically measure the point at which the amplification proceeds above that threshold, uh, and we call that the CT value. So uh, this is a scale in terms of number of cycles of PCR. And uh, so this first one, the most abundant one, is coming up at a CT value of 17 cycles. The next one is at about 19 cycles. And this last one, which you can't see really, 
is um, at 20.7 approximately cycles. So the higher the CT value, the less abundant the target RNA. And, uh, and that's basically how we measure these things. Of course, the value for, for uh, this CT is going to depend on uh, where we set this threshold. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later. Now, why would you do quantitative PCR um, as opposed to, for example, a microarray? In a microarray, you can read 40,000 genes. You can get the whole genome as opposed to just 10 or 20 or 50 genes. Uh, but qPCR is, is really more quantitative. Uh, microarrays measure just hybridization. They work within a certain range of, uh, of a, a certain dynamic range, um, but they're not as quantitative as qPCR. And so most people use qPCR as a confirmation for leads that they might find in a microarray experiment. It's obviously more targeted, um, which means that it's, it's cheaper if you're only going to amplify uh, a dozen or so genes, that's much less than doing an entire microarray. But of course, you should realize that it's cheaper by the experiment, not by the gene. The microarray is really the most uh, uh, cost-effective technology on a per-gene basis, but sometimes you're not interested in the whole genome. And uh, the other thing about qPCR is you can uh, do it with less input RNA than for a typical microarray experiment. Uh, which, depending on the platform, you might need um, at, you know, close to half a microgram or so of RNA. Here you can use very little, even as much as or as little as a single cell's worth of RNA. So then we come to why do single cell qPCR? And, uh, and that's really where this fluidine platform shines. And uh, it's really to examine the heterogeneity of a cell population. So, uh, the way we've used it, for ex one way that we've used it is uh, to look at tetramer binding T cells uh, in a specific antigen system and, and ask how similar they are to one another. So they're all T cells that are binding a particular peptide MHC construct, so they all are specific for the same epitope, but how similar are they in gene expression for a variety of other markers? Um, and so that's the kind of question we can answer. We can also look at rare cell populations. So there's another uh, project, which I won't talk about today, but which we've done in the HIMC in collaboration with Carrie Nadeau's lab, where we've actually s looked at basophils that they sorted uh, as single cells, or actually in this case not single cells, but I think uh, a small number of cells from allergic versus non-allergic donors. And we could look at the gene profiles of those small populations of purified sorted bas basophils. So, um, and, and again, there would not have been enough RNA to, to really run a microarray. So that's why to do single cell qPCR. Now, why use a microfluidic platform? This is my last introductory question. Um, and, and really, it comes down to how much reagent you use, because obviously, with mic uh, microfluidics or nanofluidics, you can use very little target uh, uh, template, but also very little of the buffers and primers. So that actually saves you cost. Um, it's partially uh, made up for by the cost of the chips that I'll show you, um, but uh, it, it is uh, at least somewhat offset uh, in terms of the reagent use. So you also, though, end up doing much less pipetting. You really just have to load samples on one side of the chip and um, reactions on the other side. And that saves you a ton of time when you're setting up a large qPCR array, and it obviously makes for less pipetting errors, um, which uh, people who've done this in the lab tell me that if you tried to do 96 samples by 96 qPCR uh, reactions, you'd kind of go nuts with the pipetting. So here's what it looks like. Uh, they call these chips uh, dynamic arrays. And as I already alluded to, you have on one side uh, a set of assay inlets. So these are the um, reactions, the qPCR reactions that you load here uh, on this side. And on the other side, a set of sample inlets where you obviously load your RNA sample, be it uh, from a single sorted cell or uh, from a bulk RNA prep. And uh, I'll get to the, the, the way that we uh, 
prep that RNA uh, to make cDNA and to preamp it before we put it in to the sample inlets. But basically, you pipette sample on one side, reactions on the other. And then in the instrument, all of the combinatorial chambers are filled, meaning that uh, using these little tiny systems of sample uh, and assay lines and valves, you fill up chambers that hold nine nanoliters each for a 48 by 48 chip, six nanoliters in the 96 by 96 chip, and it is within those little nanofluidic chambers that the qPCR reactions are then carried out. So, uh, so all the combinatorial pipetting is avoided. It's all done for you um, in this chip. So this is what the output looks like. Um, in this example, it's a 48 by 48 array. And so we've got our genes up across the top here. You don't have to know what they are, uh, but this is just as an example. And then our different samples, which in this case were single tetramer positive cells. So we've got 48 or so different cells. It might be a couple less than that um, if there were a couple of failed ones, but I think pretty much 48 cells. And uh, the last two columns here are positive controls. That's why they're lighting up um, in yellow. Uh, and the middle row here where everything is pretty much blank is the no template control. So basically that's telling you that the system works. And uh, you can see that there are certain genes that are amplified and others that are not. There's a lot of things in this particular experiment that are not amplified. Um, but you can, uh, in the software that gives you this display, you can click on any one of these cells and see the underlying uh, CT curves. So you can actually uh, QC and, and, and decide on thresholds and do all of that sort of um, uh, looking through the data. But this is the summary of all of the data. All right, so what is the workflow in detail then? Obviously, if we're going to do a single cell experiment, we've got to have some way of depositing single cells, first of all, in a 96-well plate. And generally, we do that by fax sorting. And so you've got to stain the cells and then sort them. And they get sorted in a 96-well plate, a conventional 96-well plate, um, not into the array, obviously, but into a conventional 96-well plate. And they're sorted into a, an RNA lysis buffer called Cells Direct. And then that plate is taken onto a conventional PCR machine, and a preamplification step is done. And this is very important because whenever you start with a tiny amount of input RNA, whether it be from a single cell or just from a very small sample, you've got to do preamplification. And the way that's done is by pooling the various primer sets for all of the genes that you're going to be amplifying singly in the chip and basically doing a pooled amplification for a certain number of cycles. And I think, you know, we've experimented with this, but I think something like 14 cycles is about right for single cells. And then uh, you basically can dilute that preamplified cDNA. And um, if you want, this is, uh, is, is in italics because it's an optional step. If you want, you can do a PCR reaction for some housekeeping gene in order to screen which of your wells actually had a cell that had RNA uh, to load on the chip. And, and typically, we have not done this step because we found that our fax facility here is really very good about doing single cell deposition. And we almost never get uh, a blank well. And so we basically skipped this step. At any rate, then, you need to uh, prime the chip. And that's basically uh, getting all of the uh, chambers working and filled with buffer. Load the preamped cDNA on the chip. Again, on one side, you load the samples. On the other side, you load the uh, assays. Um, you do the assays from a, a, a dilution plate and load them. And then you, uh, you basically load the chip, which means you make all the connections in the instrument uh, of all of the reactions and samples and, uh, and run the PCR reaction, and then analyze your data. So how does this all take, you know, how much time does all this take? Uh, we've kind of plotted it out here. The total for a 48 by 48 array is maybe 15 hours, uh, maybe 18 hours for the 96 by 96. That's not really counting the analysis time, because God only knows you can analyze this data 
in many ways for a long time, and depending on how many experiments you do, you might be at it for quite some time. And uh, I, I have to say I borrowed this table from uh, Ophir Goldberger in the Davis lab who uh, gave uh, a very similar talk like this last year. And uh, so the humor here is all his. But basically, this is the cost of all these things. And uh, as they say in the, uh, in the commercials, the, the data analysis is what's priceless. So it basically comes out to a couple thousand dollars in reagent cost, um, more for the 96 by 96. And that sounds like a lot, but if you think about that you're getting a couple of thousand or several thousand results, um, it ends up being pretty competitive with what you would pay if you were doing um, a conventional qPCR array, uh, again, with way more input time in terms of pipetting and so on. So uh, it's a not inexpensive, but a competitive uh, technology. So let me then talk a little bit about how we've used it in the setting of tetramer-positive cells. Um, <clears throat> but first, actually, let me use this slide to tell you about the reproducibility of the platform. So this is an experiment that um, G in our lab did early on, uh, basically using uh, tetramer sorted cells uh, in two different experiments and running the exact same chip. And basically the results look very, very comparable. Again, you've got this no template control in the middle. Uh, your gap DH and 18S, which are the positive controls on the right side. Um, and uh, various other genes here. And you can see there's a couple of genes that are always amplified um, in these particular tetramer positive cells. And there's other genes for which uh, there's heterogeneity, and some cells are positive and some they're negative. But that pattern is highly reproducible between the two experiments. And uh, this happens to be cells that were sorted uh, using a tetramer for CMV, uh, PP65 protein uh, epitope uh, restricted by HLA-A2. So then what we wanted to ask really was how these tetramer positive cells differ between individuals and between epitopes, whether those epitopes come from the same CMV protein or whether they come from different CMV proteins. And so in the initial set of experiments, which were set up by a summer student, Nicole Delal, um, we had actually uh, four donors that were healthy CMV positive uh, individuals. And the first two were um, basically positive for this HLA-A2 restricted epitope of PP65. That's one of the major late proteins of CMV. And then the other two donors were positive for different epitopes. And uh, in donor three here, we had uh, two different restricting elements that uh, uh, could, be, could identify epitopes from uh, UL44 and, a diff and actually the same PP65 epitope. And in donor number four, it was two different B7 restricted epitopes of PP65 that were not the A2 epitope. So um, within donors three and donor four, we were going to compare how the tetramer positive cells looked in terms of their gene expression between these two epitopes and between these two epitopes. And between donor one and donor two, we were going to compare how the same uh, a cell specific for the same epitope of A201 PP65 compared between donors. And so the protocol was this. Uh, basically, we started with PBMCs from these four donors, rested them a couple hours, activated briefly with PMA ionomycin so that we could see what uh, gene expression could be induced. So I should note that we could have done the same experiment with resting tetramer positive cells, and that would be interesting too. But we decided to use PMA ionomycin stimulated cells. And then we stain with either a tetramer or a dextramer. Um, with some other markers so that we can uh, identify viable uh, tetramer positive cells, and then we sort them for the qPCR. <coughs> Excuse me. So this uh, first experiment then shows the comparison of donor one and donor two. And uh, there were some actually some failed reactions here, so we're not looking at 48 genes. Uh, but actually just a subset of those 48 genes that actually worked in both chips. And that uh, got better in the later experiments. But in this experiment, it's a little, 
bit of a limited subset. Nevertheless, I think you can see that the major genes that are highly expressed are highly expressed in both donors. Uh, again, positive control is off to the right. Um, and the, the pattern here is really very similar between the two. So uh, we quantified this further with uh, a correlation plot. And we do get a significant correlation um, between the patterns for these two donors. And we've actually done uh, a series now uh, with help from Sheena Gupta in the lab uh, of about eight or 10 different uh, A2 positive donors. And we typically see the same patterns all the way across uh, with high correlation. Now what about if we look at uh, that donor three in which there were two different epitopes um, actually, I think this is donor four, the one that has two different epitopes uh, of PP65. Both of them restricted by HLA-B07, um, and, uh, and they're both epitopes from the same protein of PP65, but they're different epitopes. Turns out that these also have very similar patterns of gene expression. And uh, I'm using a little bit of a different display here uh, in which it's either on or off, red or black. Um, and we're experimenting with what's the best way to display these data. But um, nevertheless, you can sort of see that uh, where there is a red streak, there's a red streak all the way down if for both epitopes. Uh, and where it's you know, partially red, it's partially red here. Uh, with very few exceptions, here's maybe one that has a little more red in this uh, epitope than in that epitope. In either case, there's a subset of cells that seem to have a higher level of expression across many of the genes. Um, and, uh, and actually, we're doing further data analysis to decide whether that is artifact um, or whether that's really a subset of activated cells that are present um, in, in uh, uh, T cells for both epitopes. Um, but generally, the, the bottom line is that these look about as similar as the two uh, donors that had A2 restricted T cell responses for the same epitope. So, Epitopes from the same protein seem to engender very similar T cell responses. And then here's the final example in which we have uh, two different epitopes from different proteins uh, that are present now. Both of these responses present in the very same donor, so we're not looking across donors. But despite the fact that it's within the same donor, donor despite the fact they're both CMV epitopes, um, because they come from different proteins, we, th uh, we assume, we hypothesize, they actually have more differences in terms of their phenotype. And I've circled here in yellow the places where one uh, epitope response is more highly expressed for a certain gene than the other. And uh, there's about five of these that are significant. So although the overall patterns are still quite similar, um, this actually falls below the threshold for significance in terms of correlation between these two patterns. It's less than 0.05 um, significance uh, p-value, but um, and, and there's definitely ones that are, are significantly different. So, uh, so even though it looks rather similar, it's much less similar than the other two cases I showed you. So um, with that, I'm going to basically tell you just a few things about what the challenges of this system are, um, as we've learned from this project and also from other projects that we've done. Uh, basically, with regard to single cells, you need to have accurate cell sorting. And we're really lucky to have a skilled fax facility here. Um, and so we haven't really had problems with that. But other people have reported that um, if the cell sorting is just a little bit off, then uh, they may only get half of the wells that actually got a cell, and so then you have to go through that screening step and so on. In terms of the RNA, if you go from bulk RNA as opposed to single cell, it's very important to titer the input RNA amount. And, uh, and G did some experiments uh, in this regard and showed that um, even with bulk RNA, you really need preamplification on this system. You can't just start with more input RNA and make up for it. So there, in fact, there's some kind of inhibitory effect that we see where if we put in too much starting RNA, if you put in you know, uh, 200 nanograms of RNA, um, you're not going to get good amplification. And actually, you need to be more in the range of, of about 10 nanograms of, of RNA uh, 
uh, in a, and then appropriate cycles of preamplification to really hit that sort of sweet spot where the fluid ion works well. In all cases, it's important to do your pipetting carefully into the array. If you introduce any bubbles, and, and these are small inlet chambers, so you do have to be careful. Uh, you introduce bubbles, you're not going to fill the chambers correctly, and then you get a failed row or a failed column. And data analysis is somewhat of a challenge because, as I alluded to in the beginning, you've got to pick um, a good threshold value that works across your samples, and you've got to decide how to deal with those reactions, those occasional reactions, where the data quality is simply poor. And I'll show you what I mean by that. Actually, this is a, is a very good example, in my opinion, um, of all of the data from an array, uh, from, from one full array, uh, in which you see there's a lot of genes that never really amplify. They're going straight across here. And you can set a threshold value where um, all of the genes that are amplified are coming up at various levels with the least abundant messages being these here. They're only amplifying after, you know, 36 or 37 cycles. That's essentially almost absent um, uh, uh, gene expression. And, and so in this case, the target can be set pretty easily. There's other cases where you might have a lot of in-betweens, uh, where you have things that come up a little bit and back down, or they just don't have a nice smooth curve to them, um, and so on. So picking this target uh, threshold value uh, can be a little bit tricky. But um, this is one way to help you to sort of look at all the data and pick that value um, and then decide which values, if any, you need to discard. And so the conclusions that I'll leave you with uh, with regard to the system is that you really enable a large qPCR experiment with this platform. It's good for bulk RNA or single cells. Uh, because in any case, in, in either case, you minimize the pipetting and the reagent use. It's particularly advantageous with single cells. Uh, but good cell sorting and good pipetting are essential, and it's really ideally suited to look at cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity. And with regard to cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity, what we were finding in our CMV project is that tetramer-positive cells can share certain commonly expressed genes, and I didn't point these out when we were looking at the... Uh, the, the heat maps because it's too hard to see what's what. Um, but basically, they are, are activation markers and some cytokines and things that you might expect um, these uh, T cells specific for CMV to express. Uh, I wasn't really expecting TGF beta, but it did come up. Um, and then there are some genes that were very highly variable between epitopes, um, and, and they're listed here. And the basic concept is that the tetramer positive cell specific for one epitope, although they're heterogeneous as a population, their distribution of gene expression is very similar across donors and also similar for uh, uh, cells specific for two epitopes derived from the same CMV protein. Whereas tetramer positive cells that are specific for epitopes of different proteins are less similar to each other. And, uh, and so what that sort of suggests is that if you want to, let's say, design a vaccine that induces a certain type of response, a certain phenotype of T cell, it might be as simple as just knowing what epitopes or what proteins uh, within that pathogen to target. So these are the folks that I've uh, mentioned have done the work. Sanchita I didn't mention, but it was uh, involved in the data analysis and generating the heat maps. Ophir in Mark Davis's lab um, really helped us get going on this technology and is their resident expert uh, on the fluidyme. Um, and I borrowed a couple of the slides I showed you from him. Uh, Evan Newell has also helped us with regard to the CMV project and tetramers. Uh, and obviously Mark uh, for supplying all of the, uh, the instrument and, and uh, technology. So uh, I'll stop there and happy to take some questions. Yes. Good question. Um, obviously, you're analyzing a whole lot fewer cells here than you would by, say, flow cytometry. And although, you know, they're sorted, so they're, they're the enriched uh, fraction. Um, 
And, and so I don't really know a good answer to that. I think uh, it's going to depend really on how similar the cells are to each other. So if your populations are pretty homogeneous, you don't need as many cells to, to show statistical significance. Uh, if they're more heterogeneous, then, you know, and you want to show differences, then you need more cells. Um, I didn't mention, but the, the single cell experiments we've only done on a 48 by 48 array, and that's at the recommendation of the company. They don't actually recommend doing single cell qPCR from the 96 by 96, unless they've changed that recently. But um, I think the, you're just dividing the RNA too many ways. So in a practical sense, you're kind of limited to look at 48, unless you want to do multiple chips. Yes? <clears throat> well, it's actually pretty easy because um, ABI sells these TACMAN assays for many different genes. I mean, pretty much any gene you want to pick um, in, in the human genome, you can get a TACMAN assay. And uh, it may be that you want to validate that assay on the Fluidine platform, but our general experience is that the TACMAN system works really well here. So um, I don't think we've encountered one where it hasn't worked in fluidine. Um, if you want to try other kinds of amplification systems, it may be a little bit more validation involved. Yes? How variable is your preamplification depth? Hmm. So it's hard to know how to, to assess that necessarily. Um, what we can say is that by doing uh, an experiment with different cycles of preamp, we can get quite different results. And we did this really just with the bulk RNA, not with single cell, where 14 cycles is what was recommended by the company, and that's just what we did. Um, but with bulk RNA, we did try several different um, numbers of cycles, and it does quite change the results. What I don't think we've done is to say, you know, if for, an, for a given number of cycles of preamp, how reproducible is it, other than I showed you that one experiment where it seemed pretty reproducible. Um, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's basically the fluorescence signal from the TACMAN assays, but it's read in the fluidime instrument. So the fluidime, there's actually two pieces to the fluidime system. One is a machine that basically loads the chips and makes all of the fluidic connections. And then you put it in another uh, instrument that actually does the cycle, cycling and reading of the fluorescent signal. So it's a PCR machine and it's a loader. But it's not the super well, you don't know. No, it's a, it's a fluid. It's based really for, for that chip, for reading from that particular chip. So, yeah. and, uh, and it's not a cheap system. I think it's, I don't know. Uh, G, do you remember how much it is? it? Like 40,000? 150. 150, okay, more. Yeah, okay, that sounds about right. So, yeah, not a cheap system. And in some ways, you could argue, you know, it's um, why not just do CYTOF, right? At the protein level, you can do even more than 48 different, uh, uh, you know, uh, targets, and you can read out a whole lot more than 48 cells. Um, on the other hand, there are some things that may not be appropriate to look at um, with antibodies, and here you're not limited by antibodies. <laughs>